ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون والحمد لله الذي من علينا بمحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وبآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم ومبغضيهم وغاصبي حقوقهم من ليلنا هذا إلى يوم الدين صلاة محمد الله Majid says that what is of importance is taqwa al that piety and virtue which has been entrenched, consolidated, that which becomes unshakable, that which emanates from heart. And we have discussed that in this ayah, Quran differentiates between that piety which is mere lip service or that which is merely superfluous. It has got to be deep rooted so that it is perpetual and permanent and reflected in our action. The most surprising thing is that piety is not primarily found in the acts of worship as it is normally believed. That means it is not at all correct to say that since a person is very regular in his worship or in the acts of worship or that he prolongs them, has a habit of going to sajda for a few more minutes, or frequently goes to sajda, or has many rakats to pray, and very long taqib and wadifa follows the prayers, therefore he is pious. That sort of surmise and appraisal is not correct. Although it is partly correct, but there is something very important missing behind it. In the tragedy of Karbala as it unfolds from Mecca, the very prominent statement that catches our eye in history is the statement by Imam Hussein salam when he was asked by Walid, the governor of Medina, to swear the oath of allegiance on the hands of Yazid. The first answer was, Mithli la yubayu mithla. A man of my caliber, a man of my understanding and practice, does not swear oath of allegiance on the hands of men like Yazid. What was the comparison? When he said men like me and men like Yazid, there must be some comparison. Was it because Hussein was son of Fatima and Yazid was not? Did he say that because of my lineage and my descendants I claim superiority over Yazid? No. No. Although the superiority was definitely there. But Imam Hussain is comparing the conduct, the behavior, the spoiled decorum of Yazid. Mithli, man like me, means a man who has got taqwa al A man in whom Faith is unshakable. A man who heard Quran being revealed and implemented. A man who was in the laps of the Prophet 
when confronting the Christians of Najran on Mubahila. A man looking at his face, the priest and the Catholic priest tells his community, when I look at the faces of the children of the Prophet, Hassan and Hussein, I feel that we must not confront such pious faces. Men like me means that. Men like Yazid means one whose conduct is bad. One whose akhlaq is deteriorated. One who is degenerated. One who is vicious and malicious. The comparison is not of lineage, descendants, parenthood. The comparison is not about any other worldly possessions. The comparison is between the conduct of Hussein and the conduct of Yazid. He drinks and drinks openly. He committed adultery and committed it without any remorse. He gambles and gambles with pride advertises it. He usurps the property of others and there is none to tell him. He sits claiming to be the vice gerent of the Prophet and acts exactly opposite to what the Prophet taught. The conduct, the decorum, the mannerism, the behavior and that is why Imam Hussein al-Islam said that it is impossible for a person who is on akhlaq of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to follow one who is on akhlaq of shaitan. The Prophet himself has said تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ اللَّهِ except the behavior and conduct that has come from Allah and that purity of conduct is the main root of piety. From that you get Salat. From that you get Saum. From that you get Hajj. Let me give example. The Prophet himself is sitting and he listens to one lady abusing her servant maid servant, abusive. The words fall on the ear of the Prophet. There is a lady who is abusing her maid servant in the month of Ramadan. Apparently she is fasting and so is the servant. And the Prophet says to that lady, would you go and eat? And she says, Ya Rasulullah, I am fasting. It's the month of Ramadan. The Prophet said, what is the meaning of fasting while you are abusing your maid servant? The question is that the fast did not become baffled by abusing the maid servant. But the Prophet is trying to teach her that it is first the akhlaq and then ibadah. Do we understand that? For Hajj. Is it not surprising to go to Hajj and listen to people quarreling over one tin milk? Is it not surprising? Right on the day of Arafah, when everything should be forgotten but Arafah, people quarrel, say, you have spent one more pound from the common till, and therefore I must have. You have had one more ice cream. People fight over petty things. Call, forgetting everything. Quran says, لا فسوقا ولا جدال في الحج. There can be no transgression of our limits. And there can be no quarrels in Hajj. Because if there is Hajj and there is no akhlaq, then there is no Hajj whatsoever. So every ibadah, every worship is preceded by first this conduct and akhlaq. That is why Nasikh tawarikh one of the books of history in second volume, says that the first public address by the Prophet was, after having invited the people to accept Islam, 
The first public address was Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The first one on a small stone, just like a small box. On a very small stone, the Prophet raises himself and addresses himself to the crowd. People are not there to listen, but Muhammad has the courage against all the oddities and adversities to see that the mission is reached, raising himself on that small stone near Kaaba. He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of Allah, the most merciful and compassionate. And the people listen. Ayyuhal Nas, O people, not Ayyuhal Muslimun. There are still no Muslims there. Ayyuhal Nas, Akshu bis Salam. When you meet each other, you begin with Salam. Don't wait people for people to give you Salam. Akshu bis Salam. That is akhlaq. Is it not so? The Prophet said, whoever is higher must begin and initiate salam. If you are riding and someone is walking, it is for you to initiate salam. If you are sitting on a member and people are down there listening to you, it is for the one on member who is raised on a platform to give salam to those who are still sitting low. A person is standing meets a man sitting, it is for him who is standing to initiate with the salam. And it is recorded in history that the Prophet always initiated the salam himself. Even to the children, whenever he met, Muhammad would be the first to say, Salamun Alaikum. Afshu bis salam wa at'imu ta'am and give food to the poor and the starving. Feed! Akhlaq again. And after that, wasilu bil arham and maintain relationship and mend with those who are related by blood. Sila raham, a brother, a sister, a son, those who are related to me by raham, by womb. That means either we are born of the same womb or the wombs are so close that we are consanguineal, related by blood. Those are known as arham, and to make amends with them despite all the quarrels is wajib, and to cut off the relation is haram. <coughs> and the Prophet says, Wasilu bil arham, maintain relation with your blood. Is it in ibadah? Akhlaq. Afshu bis salam, wa at'imu ta'am, wasilu bil arham. And then last he said, وَصَلُّوا بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّاسُ نِيَامْ تَدْخُلُوا الْجَنَّةَ بِسَلَامٍ Whole program is there. Begin with salam. Feed the people who need. Maintain blood relation with those who are related to you. And pray in the night when the whole world is asleep. You shall enter heaven unmolested. Whoever stands up in the middle of the night at home to pray namaz e can always be expected to be a regular prayer of daily prayers. I mean, there can be no meaning of a person rising for namaz e when and there is no namaz e We find that the Prophet's first declaration is about akhlaq. And that is why he said, Mu'istu li utammima makarim al-akhlaq. I have been sent by Allah so that I may send the code of conduct to its sublimity, to its height. And that is why there can be no taqwa if there is no akhlaq. And I'm going to give some, some very, very apt examples. For the young men who ask, Mullah, we would like to be pious, we would like to be virtuous, show us the way. I am not there to show the way because the way is not mine. I am just here to relate the way that has been taught by the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt. So that I also wish to follow that. Well, that is how young men and women can begin on the path of virtue and piety. Practical lessons. It was not only theorizing 
that I spoke about Sha'illah and Taqwa al Today we are going to discuss how one enters. The first and foremost thing is that what actually stops us from entering? From entering into the fold of piety. What stops us? The love of this world, the love of this world, and the love of this life. We place so much importance and we attach so much importance to this life and the love for it that we forget that the life had a purpose behind it and together. For the sake of some very petty pleasures, for some selfishness, for that egoism, for being self-centered, for being always concerned about oneself. Selfishness, one's own pleasures, we don't enter. We don't enter the precinct of fight. One of the things which takes us right into the sin and right into the vices is anger, anger, anger. When a person is angry, why is he angry? Have we ever analyzed? <coughs> Mahatma Gandhi used to say that if a person becomes angry, then there are only two situations. Either he is right or he is wrong. There can't be the third one. A person is angry, either the particular question for which he is angry is the right question, or it is a wrong question. Or the person himself is truthful or a liar, but he is angry. If he is a liar, then he has no right to become angry. And if he is truthful, he has no reason to become angry. Because the truth <coughs> shall always rise. If it is not understood today, it will be understood tomorrow. So what is anger for? But when a man gets angry, Imam Ali salam said, the moment you get angry, the first thing is that the balance of your mind wavers. The Prophet said, Ya Ali, Iza Ghazibta. Oh Ali, when you get angry, Ijlis, sit down. وَإِن كُنْتَ جَالِسًا And if you are already sitting, فَقَدْ Sleep and drink water and if possible count up to ten before you speak. And the moment one gets angry, if he does not control himself, he enters the fold of vice and impiety, except in one situation. When one gets angry, I remember when I used to relate the whole incident to our Western friends, the incident that we have heard of several times, and every time we hear, we say Subhanallah, and we are pleased and happy about the excellence of our Imam. But when the Westerners listen to this, those who are not Muslims, they are thinking as to how this can be explained when we know that Imam Ali salam raises his sword to kill an enemy and that man spits on the face of Ali ibn Abi Talib and that sword is withdrawn and Imam Ali salam leaves the enemy free and someone asks Ya Ali the enemy was within grip and control and you have left him he is now scot free. And Imam says, yes, there is only one very fine line of distinction. When I raised my sword, it is anger for Allah. And when he spat on my face, it was anger for self. I would not like this to get mixed up. The niyyah and intention must remain untarnished for Allah and not for myself. So, anger is only justifiable when it is for Allah for Allah. 
but otherwise anger takes us far away into into the grips of shaitan for small things when we lose our temper we know where we are we are all mortals and human beings but the seeds of fitna the seeds of discord and disunity begin with anger and the second thing is greed all these akhlaqiyat i am not talking of any ibadah which will take us into piety taqwa cannot come without controlling anger and then we come to greed lalach mulla sahab can't you ask for one fatwa to allow me to sell beer one fatwa and nowadays the beer is also halal because it does not contain alcohol and people come with arguments as flimsy as mulla sahab if it were haram it would not be sold in saudi arabia well for a particular article to be haram or halal it does not at all relate with being sold in saudi arabia or anywhere else it relates to the hadith of the prophet halal muhammad halal ila yawm al qiyamah wa haram muhammad haram ila yawm al qiyamah that which has been made halal by muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam is halal forever but it is greed the worldly greed have we ever seen a man after having got all that he desires tries to grab somebody's land even the fringes when zulkarnain as it is reported in our history conquered conquered so many lands finally arrived at a place where he found the people are all slim thin so he asked he said are people suffering from some disease here or is the weather very bad because nobody seems to go sideways all slim there must be some disease or the place is infected and someone said zulkarnain no one is diseased here no one is ill everyone here is a very wise man sage and sagacious we are all thinkers and philosophers and we are people of some realistic tendencies we simply can't grow fat so oh so they took him they took him to graveyard and on the graveyard he saw tablets on each tablet it was written so and so died two years so and so died one year so and so died six months and none was there older than four years he said the whole generation has died in infancy there must be very big mortality rate he said no we don't measure death or life by years we measure life from the moment he started realizing what life was and what it was for someone realized at the age of 56 died at 58 so he lived for 2 years for the rest he was just as good as vegetating so then he decided that he had come to a wonderland and then they invited him to a lunch but the plates were all covered and as they were uncovered each plate contained gold and silver gems he looked it hungry he was and he said dear friends i am hungry i don't eat gold i don't eat silver i don't eat gems haven't you got food they said do karne if it were for food only you would not have come to this distant land you have come for this therefore take this as for food allah gives you everywhere and your tummy can be filled with 50 p of food but you have come for thousands of miles we are giving you what you have come for for this is the greed 
which has drawn you from your land up to here, bearing all the inconvenience. <laughs> Greet. And since this is in English, and I've said this in Urdu before, I must repeat that greed takes us so far that Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam came to the mosque and just as he tried to dismount from his horse one man comes there with all his love and affection says Ya, ya Amir al-Mumini don't bother about tying the animal. I'll do it for you. It's just like parking your car. Mullah comes in, somebody says, Mullah sahab, don't worry about parking your car. <laughs> you just get down and go to Bimba. We will do the lot for you. Imam came there and this man says, yeah, I mean, don't, don't, don't bother about this. We will do it for you. And Imam said, all right, do it. Went to the mosque. After the prayer, sat with his companions, as usual, guiding them, counseling, advising, answering questions. Imam! And suddenly Imam said, where is that friend of mine, who was so helpful and obliging and courteous? So somebody said, Ya Ali, we never saw him. We never saw him. So Imam said, he must be there outside binding my animal, just go and see. And they went out and they found that the Imam's animal, the horse, was just going about uncontrolled. And the rain, which is a beautiful rain given as a present to Imam Ali, had been stolen. It's just like this. The Mullah Sahib will park your car and you go to me. When I come back, I see the steering road is not there. <laughs> or perhaps the whole car has disappeared. So Mawla smiled and he took his own horse and went into the particular bazaar where the reins were being sold. There was a whole bazaar where horse reins were actually being sold. And just as he washed each and every shop, he saw one at particular desk, the same rein of his own kept for sale. It was something special which had come from outside, somebody had given as a gift. It wasn't available in the bazaar of Pupa. So Imam looked at it. And the trader said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, do you like it? So Imam said, yes, I do. Well, where did you get this from? He said, Ya Ali, a few minutes before you arrived, one gentleman came and sold this to me. Imam said, would you like to sell this to me? He said, yes, for how much? He said, Ya Ali, no profit from you. He sold for eight dirham. I'll give to you for eight dirham. So Imam took out eight dirham and gave it to the seller. Took his own reign and turning back to Kambar and his other friends, he said, Believe in Ali as I tell you. By the name of Allah who sent Muhammad. <laughs> offered me his service near the mosque, I had decided in my mind that for the labor that he has going to, he's going to take and for the pain that he will take, I shall pay him eight dirham. I wanted to pay him eight dirham. I had decided in my mind, but the man did not wait for halal to come. Whatever came to him was to come, but came by haram. This is the meaning of greed. It takes us into haram. It makes us eat haram. People running lottery shops. <coughs> Race horse businesses. Mecca. Astaghfirullah <laughs> Rabbi When my son came from Nairobi, for the first time as a stranger, he used to ask me, Mullah Sahib, Papa, I would like to go to Mecca bookshop. I said, why? It must be religious bookshop. I said, it will carry you off the religion. <laughs> That Makkah is not Makkah and that bookmaker is not a bookshop. If you want to go, go to Al Huda. <laughs> the name is misguiding. It is Mecca bookmakers. Greed. <coughs> so, gentlemen, 
these two things I have discussed. They are the evils of akhlaq. They are the evils of akhlaq. And from here we enter into vices. And from here if we come out, we come into the field of taqwa. We shall discuss more, inshallah, tomorrow. When I shall explain you how further two or three qualities can be avoided so that we really become muttaqi. We cannot become muttaqi without mending our ways unless we teach our children. Teach our children akhlaq of Muhammad, behavior of the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt. Only then we can tell them the meaning of Salat, the meaning of Saum, the meaning of Hajj, the meaning of Zakat, the meaning of Qum. A child who has not been told by his father that when he sees an elderly person, he must respect. A child who has not been told how to respect mother and father. A child who has not been told how to behave with the elders of the community. A child who has not been told anything. Even if he came to pray five times a day, there is no piety and no virtue. And it will not help him in life unless the basic need is first explained. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The truth of ta'zim and reverence is to follow the teachings of Sayyidul Shah. This is what we have missed. Can we imagine a person, I have experienced this, I'm not making stories. I went to a place for majlis, for ten majlises, I went there. And there was a small storeroom where I saw two people preparing taboot for the night of Ashur. And one was drunk so much that actually you could smell liquor when he talked. And when we asked him what happened, he says, when I am in my true spirits, I can make a very good taboot. I can't make without going on a ride. What is he doing? What is he making? He's making a taboot, which is shabih of the reef of Imam Hussein. But since he has not understood the philosophy of taqwa and ta'zim, Reverence. He is doing something diametrically opposed to what Sayyidul Shuhada wanted. There is no reverence. The responsibility is multiple. I do not want to tell the masses, the mu'mineen, whom I consider better than myself, that this is what you are suffering from. I want to say this is what the community in general is suffering from. When a woman does not know what is high, and when she is relieved of hayd, how to make a ghusl. When a woman does not know what are pahara, when her wudu is not correct because of the nail polishes which obstruct water, because of the hairdo which does not allow masah, or even ghusl of janaba, when all these things occur, what is the meaning of coming to an azab? and showing reverence to all the replicas which need reverence. The meaning of reverence is that when I come before this alam or tabut, or I come before this member and stand up and I say, Assalamu alaikum, Ya Aba Abdullah, or Assalamu alaikum, Ya Aba Al-Fadl Abbas, it means, O oh my lords, I am your servant who follows your commands and I have come to give my greetings. This is what we are told. This is what we say when we go to Karbala. Ma'akum. Ma'akum. Jami'a Kabira. Which is recommended for every haram. The last two ayah, the last two verses in the ziyara is Ma'akum, Ma'akum. I am with you. I am with you. We repeat twice. Wala ma'a ghayrikum. And we are not with those who are not with you. So the meaning is this. Especially I say this for young people who sometimes think that this is a bundle of superstition. That one just comes here and touches the cloth of this alam, kisses and goes away. And he feels it is traditional. It is not traditional. This is the reason why. In one age of Islamic history, 
people wanted to remove the black stone from Kaaba. Hajar Aswad, those who have gone to Hajj, those who have gone to Hajj have seen and those who have not gone, may Allah bless them and give them an opportunity of going for Hajj. And of course those who have been may go again and again. There is a black stone, Hajar Aswad, which we try to kiss, known as Islam, which is Sunnah to kiss. And somebody asked Imam Ali, then why don't we remove this? Because this looks like idol worshipping. It's a stone. What does it know? And the first answer Imam Ali gave was, this is min sha'airillah. It is from the signs of God. Therefore you will not remove it. One thing. Second thing, it is a witness. So people asked him, Ya Ali, how does it witness? He said, whoever comes there, it is first sunnah. To say Allahu Akbar, suppose this is Khan e Kaaba and this is Hajar e Aswad here, I will commence my tawaf standing parallel to Hajar e Aswad. That is the point of commencement and that is where the tawaf ends. Most of us know this. Now I am standing here just as I have made a niyyah. I, what do I say? I say Allahu Akbar. I raise my palm and say Allahu Akbar looking at that stone and begin my tawaf. As I come nearer again to end the first circumambulation, I say Allahu Akbar. And again I come in. With every Allahu Akbar, I have registered myself. Imam Ali says on the day of judgment, stone will say, Oh Allah, I saw this man. I saw this man who came here and said, Allahu Akbar. Everything is registered. Imam said this, I have not said it. And then he said, if you get an opportunity of kissing it, kiss it. Kiss it. it knows, but I have finished. This stone knows and distinguishes between the kiss of a mu'min and a kiss of a munafiq. It knows the kiss of one who is pious and one who comes there to kiss with no piety, who has come to Jiddah for setting up an agency, not for Hajj, who has come for Mapesa, who has come for a holiday and picnicking, the stone knows, and the one who has come for Allah. Sha'irullah, the quality of Sha'irullah is that when I come to that alam which is apparently and ostensibly nothing but a piece of wood and cloth hanging, but because of the munasibah and relationship with Sha'irullah, when I come there and I say, Assalamu alaikum ya abal fadil abbas, gentlemen, let us decide if a stone can say on the day of judgment. Can't Abu fadil abbas say that? Can Imam Hussein not say this? So this is the meaning of reverence. What well, this is the meaning of Adama and Ta'deem. When I see an alam or I see a tabut or I see anything and I stand up and say Assalamu Alaik, to kiss or not to kiss is not important. What is important is my attitude. If I consider it as bure, as we do nowadays, the children of 20th century, who think themselves above everything, nearer to God than even the Prophet himself. When I underestimate those things, considering them as valueless, I am underestimating Sha'irullah. And when I give the esteem to it, the meaning of giving esteem is to follow the commands and to follow the message. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.